All right, everyone, welcome back to the NPC Dungeon. I am your host and Game Master for the time being, as always, and this week I have a story prepared for you, as usual. It was supposed to be in my usual descriptive short story style, but I started out running forward and I realized that it wasn't going to really be all that much, so I decided to sort of continue the tradition I started two weeks ago in The Legend of Gretkar, The Flying Meatball, and tell a more broad kind of story. And if you haven't listened to that one yet, I really recommend it. It was kind of fun. He was a really fun character to play, and I look forward to seeing what more of you think of him. Also, I'm going to go ahead and start experimenting with releasing my Game Advice episodes on YouTube in two parts instead of just one, as I referred to last week. However, in the process of outlining for this week's episode, I realized one of the hurdles associated with continuing to release these types of episodes on podcast platforms as one episode a week. So this week I will do so as I said I would, but I'll probably start releasing those as two episodes a week on podcast platforms as well as on YouTube, so you'll be getting three episodes a week no matter how you listen. As I said last week, this is just to make my episodes more digestible, because I know they can be kind of dense. It'll be the same material, just a little bit more spread out. Again, I know I say this a lot, but I really am trying to make this show as friendly as possible because I know we all don't have time to listen to these long, drawn out, 20 or so minute long episodes on DM Advice. And don't worry, these episodes will still be standalones. You will not have to listen to one to understand the other. They will not directly come from one or the other. They will still be two separate episodes just covering the same kind of stuff. But doing this plan means that I'm definitely going to start experimenting with releasing my episodes on different days rather than releasing them all on Fridays. I already said I may start releasing my D&D story episodes on Tuesdays, but since I now have three to release instead of just two, I may try to go ahead with Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or something else like that. For now, still wait for Friday. Friday is when I plan on releasing these, but if I change it, I'll try to keep you all posted. And as always, feel free to let me know what you think in the comments if you're listening to this on YouTube, but that's it for announcement this week. I know it was a lot, so I apologize for that, but I just want to keep you all caught up on what I'm doing. Now, we can finally move on with the story. So, what happened? As I said last week, this story is going to follow the introduction of the character first seen on this show in the episode The Problem with Side Quests. You don't need to have listened to that one to understand this one, but I still recommend it if you haven't, or even if you have, listen to it anyway, I'll stop you. Lots of funny little twists and turns in that one. Also, I want to go ahead and apologize, again, I've been doing a lot this episode. I got this character's name wrong in that first one, I called her Rose, but that was the name of another character in this particular player's backstory, but now it's time to write that wrong and tell you the story of Luna. My player decided to make this character his old character sister. They were orphaned and separated at youth, which is a common enough theme among D&D player backstories. She had been raised along with her little sister by a lonely hunter out in the wilderness. It was here that she realized her potential for druidic magic, and it was also here that upon reaching adulthood, she eventually decided that it was finally time to follow up on rumors she'd heard of a man fitting her brother's description, skulking along with a shadowy mercenary group. With that, she left her sister and adoptive father behind in search of a brother, taking along with her her pet velociraptor. Yes, she absolutely absolutely had a pet dinosaur. Look, this is fantasy, and we all want a pet dinosaur, don't even pretend that you don't. So if we can't in real life, why not here? Anyway, all rants about fantasy aside, an expert tracker by this point in her life, she followed the trail to a seemingly dead and abandoned city, half forested and overrun with forest and plant life. So she found a room relatively high up in a ruined building whose walls were composed of thick stone and brick, but just ruined enough to provide plenty of escape routes, and decided to set traps around her for her own safety's sake, and fell asleep with the moon high overhead, and her raptor standing guard by the door. Unknown to her, however, there was a group making their way through the same city. After the death of their companion Jack, our old friends Thane, Amaros, and Harold Bigsby decided to continue on their journey to an old city at the request of a powerful detective who'd caught them, and by them I mean Harold, stealing and required that they bring in what seemed to be a powerful cultist at the threat of framing a young man who happened to just be at the wrong place in the wrong time during their crimes. They also recently had done a favor for someone fitting the description of the person the detective asked them to take in for them. The favor was to find a map, and that person person was to meet them in this very city. As a result, they had a bit of a choice on their hands, but before they could make it, they needed to get a little bit further into the city and figure out more about just what was going on. After a run-in with a somewhat strangely sedentary tribe of gnomish nomads, who they agreed to help by finding their friends within the city, and a few other odd misadventures, they finally came upon a spot in which they could rest for a while, or so they thought. They came across a room relatively high up in a relatively secure looking building. Harold, being the rogue he was, decided to fulfill his role and scout ahead, however, he neglected to 
to follow D&D's number one rule, let's say it together, check for traps. As a quick aside, it really was actually kind of funny. Every time he did look for traps, there was nothing, so he felt secure enough to not check next when there was in fact a trap. This made him paranoid, so he checked next time when there was none, and the cycle continued. This wasn't on purpose or anything on my part, that would be bad practice as a DM, but this isn't a D&D advice episode, so let's get back to the story. Anyway, he stepped inside, accidentally tripping a wire and releasing a flood of poison gas. While Harold was coughing in a heap on the floor, Thane rushed in, arriving face to face with a large dinosaur towering over him. Keep in mind, his character had no conception of what a Velociraptor was, so even this behemoth of man was a little off-put in the presence of this beast, to say the very least. As a result, he got more than a few chunks put out of him in the ensuing fight. Amaro simply sat back laughing and staying out of it, that was until Luna swept up from behind him. He turned around and backed away, able to avoid involving himself in this fight, and after calling off his friends and convincing Luna they didn't know she was staying here, she confessed that she had been searching for her brother. After hearing her description, the group fell silent. Reading the silence, she asked, what, what's wrong? Amaros explained to her that her brother had been killed by a boat deck, which by the way was the first story I ever told on this show, and really is one of my favorites, so feel free to give that one a listen. And with nowhere left to go except for home, she decided to tag along with the group for a while, at least for now, she said. At this point, my party had a few options of how they wanted to progress forward. I'm not going to tell any specific stories from this part of it, but I'm going to gloss over it a little bit because it is still kind of funny. One of the routes they could have taken was a journey down into a sewer grate leading into a sewer network deep underneath the city. They tried this one first, the idea being that this would lead them deeper into the city without having to avoid any of the dangers of the outside world, but the world below was far more dangerous than they predicted. After not even having taken two steps into this place, a lone roper lashed out at them. If you don't know, a roper is like a giant stalagmite with giant flying tendrils and a big mouth. It's a really fun creature in my opinion. It severely wounded Luna, but Harold Bigsby had an idea. He downed a stolen potion of etherealness and sent a flying sword after it. Gotta give the guy points for creativity. He made quick work of the thing, and the group eventually moved on, scouting out a camp of some kind not far from where they were. They tried to look over this interesting camp underground, but they attacked the party on contact, forcing them to retreat, and retreat they did, right into the hunting grounds of a blind old beast that lived underground here. And after stealthily escaping the tense silence, they found themselves surrounded by an echoing chanting, reverberating from around them from a chamber not far off, but not wishing for any more trouble down here than they already had, and feeling lower for wear, they turned around, ready to climb up out of the sewer, and take their chances with the rooftops instead. But there was another sound, a sound of sobbing they couldn't ignore. Luna broke away to find a girl who couldn't be a day over 13 or so alone in the corner. She reminded Luna so much of her sister that she pitied her deeply and had to help. She extended her hand and led her out, and along with the rest of the group. The particular player who played Luna wanted to have a little follower to go around with them and adopt as their child. And it was really fun to play this person too because they had these arguments back and forth that were the stereotypical parents, teenage, kid arguments, so expect more stories about this character in the future. But getting back to the story, they wandered and stumbled across the rooftops in search of a place to stay for now, until an arrow embedded itself in a wall next to them. Luna picked it up and removed the message that had been carefully tied to the thing. Up ahead, it read, there is a camp of gnomes who have lived here since this place has been overrun with nature. They in turn have been overrun with mercenaries who have taken over their camp. You know who they are, Luna, as you know who I am. Just past the camp is a kind of haven for merchants and vendors and anyone else stuck here. Meet me there. I need your help. It's about your brother. I didn't know you have a brother, said the girl. Had, Luna corrected. The girl continued on with them in silence as they all bounded across the rooftops. They encountered a couple of bumbling giants, which certainly deserve their own episode, and a lone merchant in the secret cluster of ramshackle buildings Luna's letter had referred to. Be sure not to disturb any of my other guests, the old merchant said, but there was nobody else. This was the group's cue to slowly back away and never come back. But we have to follow up on the letter, Luna said. And seeing that it was getting dark anyway, the rest shrugged and took one of the many empty rooms and slept overnight. The night dragged on, and it was eventually Luna's watch. Hey, said Amaros, waking her up for her turn in the watch. I'm sorry, but I don't think whoever wrote that letter is coming. She has to, said Luna, eyes peeled and vengeance in her voice. Her and I have unfinished business. Whatever you say, said Amaros, she trips back off to sleep. Luna struggled to stay awake, even long after her shift, but she refused to sleep until confronting the new leader of the mercenary guild that ruined her brother's life. And eventually, in the early morning hours, as sparse sunlight fought for entry and light rain pattered outside, the door gently parted. A tall, ragged-looking woman with an eye patch and long, blonde hair tied in the back stepped inside. What do you want? Luna demanded, an arrow already notched and ready, and shoved into the woman's face. She held up her hands and backed into a wall, where she leaned, supporting her weight. She groaned at injuries apparently even past what Luna could see. I need your help. You should have thought about that before recruiting my brother. I heard. I'm sorry, but my guild. I'm all that's left. Me and a lieutenant of mine. Rose. Luna scoffed. And that's my problem how? It's a long story. But Luna didn't falter. Then you'd better tell it fast. The woman groaned again. You were given a job. A cult had apparently taken up refuge in the city, and you were to take them out, but it was a trap. They caught and brainwashed the rest of us. 
house. I want to get them back. She also explained that her friend had been held up in that camp she alluded to in the letter. Luna shook her head. And how exactly do you intend on doing that? She explained that they were based in the center of the city, in an old government building, and that she happened to know the people who were in a nearby temple. They're organizing resurgence, and she thought they could help. I don't want this city to be held captive any longer for my mistakes. Surely you understand. Just know that I wouldn't have come to you if I wasn't desperate. But that only got the wheels in Luna's head turning. Sure, we'll help you, she said. But I'd be willing to bet that temple has some pretty nice stuff in it. You sneak in, get us some valuable relics out of it, and we'll meet you there. I can't, the woman said. I can't betray them. Quiet, Luna hissed. Awake the kid. The raptor inched closer and bared its teeth. The way I see it, you don't have much of a choice. The woman looked over the raptor and looked back over at Luna. Fine, she said. Fine, I'll help. Good, said Luna. Now get out. And the woman backed away into the rain as the rest slowly woke up. Amaros was the last to stir, but when he eventually did, he walked over and asked, So, your friend ever show? Yeah, said Luna. And? Nothing's changed. We stick to the plan. You said we had some gnomes to save? And to avoid this episode being too much longer than that, I'm going to go ahead and end it here this week. Next week, I'm going to tell a story in the same style as this one and The Legend of Grutkar the Flying Meatball, but that will be more about a character that I recently played. I'll also be going back to a concept that I mentioned both in my first episode on immersion, as well as on my episode on upgrading your combat encounters, and that is how to make your combat a little bit more difficult. And after that, I'll be coming back to Luna the following week, and I'm realizing just how many stories I have about this one campaign, so when I finish uploading this episode, I'll be making a playlist for them so that you can find them more easily if you want to listen to one or listen to any of them, or all of them. I'll also be doing the same thing for my other types of stories as well. So until next time, let's learn something. Thank you.